thank you everyone for joining us. It's a real pleasure to welcome Dennis Eganamba uh, from Hertfordshire County Council, I think. County Council. Um, yeah, yeah. So, what I, yeah, I mean, you know who I'm from Hertfordshire County Council. I mean, I, I wouldn't have said that to the others, but yeah. Okay, so, okay. So, so, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, and uh, this is what, yeah, life, yeah, life in a yacht. Okay, well, uh, over to you, and I will, I will meet my. So, uh, do, do I have to say next page to you? Okay, so yeah, next page. All right, so aims of this session uh, to have a basic understanding of youth justice, uh, the roles of yachts, uh, and the different types of professionals working within the service. There are quite a few. Um, understanding of the profile of the children who typically get into trouble uh, with the law, uh, how youth court works, does youth justice this work? Um, questions and answers. Uh, next page, please. All right, so um, a bit of my background. So uh, I'm, in fact, well, I'm a qualified social worker, um, but I've been working in youth justice for, uh, for about 10, it's for about 11 years. So before I got my social work qualification, I was doing early intervention, so I was working within a youth, uh, a youth offending team uh, within within East London, and that's when early prevention feels like a relic of the past because it was when uh, local authorities had money, and of course they well were told all the time there's no money, there's no money, um, and after I uh, graduated in 2014. Uh, I've been working in statutory services uh, for uh, what since two yeah I guess for six years now. I worked in a, uh, a few youth offending services, and they've all got their slight differences. Uh, my role as a social worker essentially is I hold um, I hold uh, court orders. So a young person goes to court, they're convicted, they're sentenced to a court order of a specific length of time, and I will supervise that. And how did I get into youth justice? Uh, I've always been interested in working with challenging young people. Uh, in, initially, I've actually gone through the voluntary youth, um, route of being in youth justice. So I've been... Uh, I've been a volunteer within one, and then I kind of just worked up my way up the ladder. Uh, you don't have to have a social work qualification to work in youth justice. Uh, I mean, generally, they would want people who are used to working with challenging teenagers. Uh, you, you could, uh, in effect, you could be a youth worker, you can be another a different type of practitioner. As long as you have that experience working with young people, you can work within a yacht. Uh, next page, please. All right, so youth justice system um, treats young people differently to adults and significant weight must be attached to the age of the suspect if they are under 18. So age of criminal responsibility is, uh, is 10, in the UK, uh, I say UK, in England and Wales to be specific. So um, that effectively means that uh, children under 10 can't be arrested or charged with a crime. Uh, there are other punishments that can be given to children under 10 who break the law. Um, England and Wales actually have the lowest age of criminal responsibility in Europe. Uh, as, I mean, if you've heard anything different, please let me know. It was previously Scotland at eight years old, but it was raised in 2019 after years of campaigning by agencies and charities um, uh, because they believed it was highly detrimental to children if they are criminalised so early in their lives. Uh, there's a statutory aim to prevent offending by children uh, and young people. Um, there's a greater focus on prevention, diversion, uh, with custody used as a last resort. Uh, separate community services 
provided by youth offending teams, support to local authorities. So in effect, um, uh, each youth offending service within the country, uh, there'll be a different one for each um, either local authority or district. Some are amalgamations within youth um, with like other uh, youth and uh, teenage services. You have um, separate youth courts and specially trained magistrates uh, who, and they have different sentencing powers. And the sentencing framework it is meant to have an emphasis on restoration and rehabilitation. Uh, so in effect, I'd say whatever is on adult gu guidelines, uh, youth sentences will be around uh, a third or half of what an adult sentence should be. And the threshold for custody is much, much, much higher. Uh, so often do I see professionals at court uh, who are used to working with adults and they'll say that person would have gone to jail. If, if they're adult, that's unfair. Um, almost with, um, with a sense of frustration sometimes. Uh, and you have um, young people when they're sentenced to custody, they all have uh, separate, um, uh, separate custodial states. So there are three types in youth justice. Uh, we've got secure children's homes uh, and STC, secure training centers. They would generally be for much younger and more vulnerable uh, children. And YOIs, young offender institutions, which tend to resemble more, they, they'll resemble uh, more so an adult prison in comparison to the STCs and the um, SCHs uh, with the YOIs, uh, young people from the age of, uh, you can have young people from the age of 15, but the majority of the time they'll be 16, 17, going on to 18. Uh, next page, please. Uh, so uh, what is a yacht? We use a lot of abbreviations in, in in my job. So youth offending team, sometimes they can be called uh, youth offending services, um, youth justice service, youth justice team. Uh, there's a kind of a, all similar, um, but they all have the same, um, the same statutory aim, essentially. Uh, we were spawned by the Crime of the Sword Act, 1998. So, for any of you that were kind of um, into politics, or you might have a bit of knowledge of politics, Labour government come in 1997. Tony Blair, very very famous quote, says, um, "Tough on crime, um, tough on the causes of crime." Uh, uh, there'd been a lot of um there's a lot of outrage about the way teenagers were, pre were presenting in society uh mainly particularly after the killing of uh, jamie bolger in 1992 if you don't know about it i'd say have a look at it uh really tragic um case where i think it was the child who was murdered was was really young I think it was like five, six, seven, eight, really young by by two by two boys who I believe those two boys were around nine or ten. And it affected the whole country, totally affected the way um, people in the UK uh, looked at teenagers. Um, so the act of the Crime Disorder Act. Uh, made it a requirement for local authorities to create yachts, um, develop youth justice plans, coordinate youth justice services, and to be multi-agency and to work in partnership with other other charities, other agencies, statutory, voluntary. Uh, so yeah, police, probation, health, education, uh, they're all required to cooperate by statute. 
I'll go into that a bit later. Um, so some of the things that yachts do, assisting young people arrested in police stations. So some yachts might provide um, uh, an appropriate adult for people who are under 18 who are arrested. Um, supporting young people and their families at court. Court for court can be a very intimidating place, and that's why each uh, each youth court you'll have a member of the youth offending team sitting. And sometimes you might have a member of the youth offending team attending court, uh, or if it's a non youth court day, because uh, a young person could be at risk of being remanded to custody, which is what we'd be trying to avoid. Uh, supporting young people serving community sentences and providing crime pre uh, prevention programs. Crime prevention programs, are, uh, they're around, but again, they're pretty few and far between. Uh, and their attention to the youth justice system, risk and need, welfare and justice. Uh, we're kind of, um, uh, wars playing around with those tensions. Um, and you can see it with sentencing, where you have other professionals going to court, and the solicitors or you know prosecutors, you have a general chip, you know, uh, an informal chat with them, and they'd be frustrated at the outcome of a young person, knowing that that would nine times out of ten, times out of ten, put an adult into custody. Uh, also bound by the Children's Act, 19, um, 1989. Uh, the needs of the child are paramount. So each bench uh, that's uh, at court, district judge um, will have to bear that in mind uh, when they are sentencing uh, a young person. Uh, next page, please. So uh, what type of professionals work within a yacht? So we've got police officers, probation officers, education workers, social workers, mental health professionals, substance misuse workers, youth workers, youth just practitioners. Um, there can be, uh, there'll be more that liaise with uh, yachts uh, in a uh, multi-agency, I mean, we call it multi-agency uh, working partnerships. Um, you would usually, I'd say sometimes if you don't have a particular a specific worker like a substance misuse worker in-house then there will be a partnership agency uh, that will work with that uh, that will work with that yacht so for example the the yacht that i work for we don't have an in-house substance misuse worker but we have an agency that we partner with uh, some yachts don't have social workers you don't need to be social work qualified um, but there will always be close ties between uh, between the yacht and social work is just because of the, the nature of the young people that we work with. Uh, next page, please. Uh, so what do I do day to day? So um, probably it will be hard to split into percentages. I might say, um, you know, 40% would be on a laptop uh, on a computer, um, might be doing uh, writing up a, a pre-sentence report, um, completing an assessment, sending emails, that kind of does that kind of stuff. Uh, seeing young people, I'd say maybe another forty percent will be seeing young people. So we'd see young people uh, in it could be different public buildings. Some local authorities will have a central kind of like yacht building where all the young people on court orders will attend there. Um, as you can imagine, you know, sometimes having kind of all the young people who have committed offences and of a certain mindset in the same vicinity, you're not going to get brilliant outcomes sometimes. Uh, but most yachts will manage that in a certain way to reduce the risks to each young person and also to staff. Um, court work, occasionally um, I will go to court. So we'll say once every 
like once every three weeks, once every month, I will uh, attend court as a court duty officer and I'll be representing the youth, uh, youth offending team. I'll talk about that more later. Um, prison. Uh, currently, I, I don't have any cases of young people in custody, uh, but it does happen. Uh, I'll give you some statistics later, but you will have uh, young people who they get sentenced to custody and you need to go and do prison visits. All right, uh, next page. Uh, what do children uh, who break the law look like? Um, some people might have some common um, perceptions. Uh, they can look like we have all sorts of young people that come through our doors. They don't wear orange boiler suits. I can say that for sure. Uh, and um, I don't know if anyone's ever watched uh, a BBC Three show called The Young Offenders. Uh, it's a bad representation of, uh, of of the kind of young people that we work with. Okay, if I'm being honest, uh, there aren't there isn't anything in mainstream culture that represents what we do um, in in the slightest. I mean, you've got TV programs like uh, Once Upon a Time, The Bill might have represented police officers. Uh, London's Burning, you know, represented the fire service. Uh, you know, casualty Holby City represent, you know, um, uh, kind of like paramedics and that kind of thing, like doctors in hospitals. And yeah, there, there isn't really anything um, that represents uh, certainly um, people who work with um, our client group, uh, not, not, not at all. So it might be hard to picture what we do because uh, we're kind of there in the background where you know young people might be in the foreground um committing offenses or uh you know involved in acts of antisocial behavior uh you guys won't kind of see what you know what we're doing maybe possibly closest thing on tv that i've witnessed uh that might represent a little of what we do would be this BBC free program called um, Defending Digger D. And Digger D is uh, a London based, uh, I guess, drill uh, musician, like rapper, uh, who he's an adult and he was getting into trouble a lot. And so he's famous in the music scene, got loads of views on, on, on YouTube and stuff. And it was a documentary going through some of his travails in his life. So in the music industry, in the criminal justice system, and it was his solicitor following him and all the cases that he was racking up and all the times he was going to court. And also his, um, you see a lot from his probation worker. And some of the stuff we do is similar to probation officers, but we work with young people more intensely. Uh, uh, next page, please. All right, so uh, I've given like a, a little case study, and with this case study, uh, I've just named the young person Archie. And um, only reason I named him Archie is that in the 10, 11 years I've I've been doing this, I've been doing this work. Archie seems to be a really common name and I don't know whether it's just I don't know it's just it's just a naughty name I have no idea it just seems to be a name I've seen so many times so apologies to anyone if you've called your child um, Archie uh, if you've got a child you call I, I apologize uh, or if you're named Archie again I apologize it's just it's just my experience but um, uh, what I would ask is that you read the case study and uh, which professionals uh, from one of the earlier slides would be working, do you think would help Archie? Uh, would be able to help him 
to desist from offending and for what purpose? And uh, I would ask you to write that in the chat. Okay, um, next page, please. So how did it work out for Archie? Um, so this is some of the stuff that was implemented for him. Um, so you can see, in fact, if you, Katie, could you go back to the previous page, please? Because I, I think I've got time to actually go through some of it. So I say um, Archie has probably got uh, the profile of a young person who we'd say there's lots and lots and lots of desistance against offending factors. So desistance against factors. We previously called them risk factors, risk risks to offending. And you can see um, unstable, uh, uh, he, he didn't have the, the best start to life, you know, adopted that too was experiencing physical abuse. Mother had a drug addiction, dad died when he was newborn. So no, um, I guess, uh, you know, that would have been, I guess, traumatic him hearing about that, uh, even if he didn't know his, his father. Uh, he's physically abused by step, by stepdad and eventually adopted. And um, yeah, I mean, he's, Mom and his stepdad obviously had another life with other kids, and he was he was adopted to you know by family in London. Um, again, really common, really commonly we'll see young people acting out at school. Uh, I mean, challenging behaviour, truancy. Uh, vast number of young people in custody. Vast, 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 vast number is something along the lines of eight, over 80 uh, percent they um they had issues at, at school in fact they were um, excluded from school permanently excluded uh smoking cannabis um involved in antisocial behavior and archie was groomed by older males um, because he was identified as being vulnerable told to commit several acts to, to prove his loyalty to, to the gang. Uh, gangs, this is kind of uh, county lines. Um, they're almost like buzzwords now in, in, in youth justice. And I'll say not in youth justice. We've known about them in youth justice for quite a long time now, but it's now crept into the mainstream and people are now aware of these kind of, uh, this kind of criminal activity and the effect it can have on on the victims. So, um, as you can see, some of the difficulties he was having is now led him to become entrenched into offending. And uh, unfortunately, he's uh, been sentenced to custody for two possession of um, knife offences. Uh, so, it, uh, next page, please. So how, how it worked out for Archie. Um, so work was, he was basically supported in essence. So uh, it's written that he had a female worker so that he'd feel less threatened. Um, upon release, upon being released from custody, he was placed into a semi-independent placement because he'd become a child looked after. So, Obviously, his um, uh, his adoptive parents disowned him, and um, essentially, the local authority would have a duty to um, to, to accommodate him, and that will be under Section Twenty of the Children's Act, nineteen eighty nine. So he needed a lot of therapeutic intervention, management around his emotions, talking about um, you know. Talk, it's taken a long time for him to talk about his past. You know, I've found in my time some. It's hard to get out some of these things. It's hard to extract some of these things from young people. And 
Uh, I've always found that if you can't do something yourself, hey, there's other professionals that can do it because essentially my role is um, I don't do everything. It's actually coordinating with people who are specialists in, 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 in different domains. Um, so we've got Archie he's talked about talking about his early years. He was angry, sad and confused, totally understandable. Um, big step for him to try, try to address his mental health. Uh, before he's 18, he's actually returned to custody. He's, he's been sentenced to custody on two other um, occasions. Uh, but the placement, they were always there supporting him with visits. So at least Archie knew that he would always be coming out to, he would always be released from prison with uh, with a named uh, accommodation. We have young people sometimes that they go to custody and uh, one of the prerequisites to them being released would be they have to have a, an, an address and some of them don't have an address and if you don't have an address you don't know where you're going to technically you're not meant to be released but what tends to happen is that an address isn't found until the last until the last moment it might be sometimes 20 24 hours before the young person's released they'll know what the address is and in those circumstances the accommodation will be um you know it's likely to be miles away from where they know and the council because they were desperate probably paid big bucks uh to try and accommodate this young person so uh it wouldn't be in so many different ways it, it, it's not ideal particularly for the um you know for the i guess emotional well-being and um upon release emphasis was put into securing some of his education training and employment uh he was in a good place emotionally coming to terms with the fact that um he was on his own but he had a good support network work on his skilled people seems like he was interested in cars mechanics so he was supported to to look into that begins an apprenticeship uh absolutely fantastic so you can see it starts working out for Archie when the right support goes in. All right, uh, next page, please. So youth court, uh, different to magistrates courts. Um, they're held in a magistrates court uh, and there are some key differences. As you can see, youth courts much more informal and you know they address defendants by their first name uh, always allow they're always allowed the defendants to speak um parents must attend if they're 16 uh, so if, if they're under 16 uh and uh, they're not open to the general public uh maximum sentence in a youth court is two years more serious offences would usually be transferred to, to Crown Court, but they can be dealt with uh, in a youth court, but indictable uh, offences, uh, so murder, rape uh, and other serious offences will always be remitted to, to Crown Court. So you can see the little differences. Uh, next slide, please. There's a image of typical youth court um, layout and also um i've put in a little video of um what a youth court uh what a hearing would uh, you know would look like so if you could fast forward to i think it's three minutes 20 please In fact, so, sorry, it'll be three minutes 55. I remember three minutes 55. And I don't know, if, um, can we get any sound on it as well? Please. Good morning. 
Your worships, our first case is David Skinner, who is not going to court. David, could you take your hat off, please? David, please stand. Tell the magistrate your name and address. David Skinner, 23 Dolphin Road, Crown Hill. Is your date of birth the 30th of the 9th, 1994, and are you 14 years old? Yes. David, because you haven't been into court before, I'm going to tell you who everybody is. On your right is the solicitor from the Crown Prosecution Service. Behind him, and also to your right, is somebody from the Youth Offending Service. And this is the court usher, who will help with the smooth running of the court. And in front of us is the legal advisor, who also helps to tell us uh, all sorts of legal issues. And the three of us are magistrates, and we're the ones who are going to decide what to do with you today. Now, David, who is on the left? David, you are charged that at Plymouth on the 28th of July 2008, you stole two compact discs to the value of £12.50 belonging to W.H. Smith. Do you understand the charge, David? Yes. Do you plead guilty or not? Guilty. David, could you sit down now, please? Your Worships, David has gone into W.H. Smith on the 28th of July with friends, has proceeded to take two compact discs from the shelf inside a bag and put the bag inside of his jacket. He then left the store without paying. Security staff followed him, apprehended him, and brought him back to the store. Police have come from elsewhere, arrested him. The goods were returned to the shop and put at a value of £12.50. I do not apply for costs in this case. Your Worships, David appears before you for the first time and has pleaded guilty at the earliest opportunity. His action on the 28th of July was completely out of character and tells me that he doesn't know that he was behaving in this way. Uh, if I may remind you that in this case, the bench only has three sentencing options available to it. Um, an absolute discharge, a referral order, or in really serious cases, um, a custodial sentence. Mr Skinner, you're the grandmother. Um, have you got anything you'd like to say about your grandson's behaviour? Well, he's doing very well at school. His behaviour actually has been better in, in, in the last few weeks. His mother stopped him going out late at night. She was mixing with people that she wasn't too happy about. He said that they had a bad influence on him. He seems to be sort of himself now. Mm -hmm. right, thank you. Your Worships, a referral order would be appropriate in this case, and we're sure that David would benefit from understanding the negative effects that friends can have on his behaviour. David, could you stand up now, please? David, do you have anything to tell you, anything to really help us about why you did this, and uh, anything else regarding the evidence? Yes, I'm really sorry, and it won't happen. Thanks, thanks, David. David, you've heard what's been said in the court today, and this is how we're going to deal with you. We're going to make a referral order for three months for the offending, the offence of shoplifting. This means that the Plymouth Youth Offending Service will set up a youth offending panel. You and your mother. Mrs. Skinner, can you make sure that David's mother is aware of all this? Because it's vitally important. His yes, mother I must attend meetings of the youth offender panel. And you must, must tell her that if she doesn't attend, she can be fined. We have the power to fund. She has to attend the day. I will tell her she's called Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones Skinner. Yes. 
make a note of that. And David, you will be required to sign a contract. And this contract will include activities that will stop you offending again. We also hope, David, that you will be asked to write a letter of apology to the show. The order starts the day you sign that contract. And David, if you don't sign that contract, you can be brought back to court and given a very different sentence. Do you understand? Yes. Very well, we will make the referral order for three months. That's all. Thank you all very much for being here. We'll stand, please. Uh, could you stop the video, please? Okay, I hope that was a. I think that was pretty realistic representation uh, of how a youth court operates. What it looks like. Um, so that was made in the noughties. They said they committed the crime in two thousand and eight. It was shoplifting offence. Um, fast forward, what? 12, 13 years, um, those are not the kind of offences that we see. Uh, we see, much, oh, in my experience, I come across much more serious offences. Um, yes, you know, you will see, I have seen young people as as, as cute as, as cute as the defendant or the, uh, however, <laughs> um, yeah, we were more likely an offence such as shoplifting would more likely be dealt with out of by an out of court disposal. Uh, if you um, go on to the next page, please. So there's a separate sentence in framework for under 18s. Uh, it emphasises rest, um, restoration and rehabilitation. Um, and has a higher threshold for the use of custody. So um, the out-of-court disposals I was referring to at the top, so youth cautions and conditional cautions, uh, we call them for short YCs or YCCs. Um, the alternative to prosecution, where the young person admits the offence uh, and it's not in the public interest to prosecute. So what would tend to happen with those is that uh, the police will make the decision more. Well, first of all, the young person would have to admit to the offence first time, and it would have to be considered by a police panel whether that offence uh, qualifies for a, for a youth caution or youth con conditional caution. It, it would have to be usually the young person's first offence. I mean, sometimes they can do it on, on a second offence, and it will be a a youth conditional caution rather than a youth caution. Um, the conditions of that caution might be for them to uh, attend um, several sessions to do with the offence that they committed. So it, it might be a, a low level offence like possession of cannabis. And they'll have to do several sessions with, uh, sometimes it can be from a professional from the youth offending service, uh, a lot of the time it will be uh, a police officer who seconded to the youth offending service. They'll deliver that youth conditional caution. And it might, it will be some sessions on harm reduction, the risks of cannabis, that kind of thing. Um, they are for, they are meant to be for minor offenses. Uh, however, we do see, I have seen young people receiving a youth conditional caution for uh, possession of, of a knife. Knives, hot topics in the media at this moment in time. Uh, for obvious reasons, they can cause a lot of harm, can cause a lot of damage. Um, we do see it, and it's totally the police. Um, you know, it, it's at the judgment of, of the police on whether they feel they will take that to, to court for prosecution or whether they'll leave it out of, um, as an out of court disposal. In my experience, generally, if it's a really, really young person, if they're like 10, 11, 12, that kind of age, and they brought it to school, 
something along those lines, they're more likely to get a youth condition and caution, more, more likely. Um, referral orders, that is the order that the, um, the bench referred to. So it's the most commonly used sentence. It is a youth sentence specifically. And uh, they can last from three months up to 12 months. And it is, uh, so um, the young person will be sent to de uh, develop a contract with a panel of community volunteers that will adjust their behavior. Someone from the youth offending team like myself will write a report about what they did, why they did it, and what you recommend are the interventions that should be put in place so that you can prevent that young person from reoffending and build up on some of their um, some of their strengths. Uh, if the young person doesn't comply, that contract that they sign is legally bind is legally binding. They can be returned to court and they can receive a more onerous punishment in fact if they don't sign it they can still be returned to court youth rehabilitation orders can last up to 12 months in fact sorry tell a lie um from three months can last up to three years they are youth orders however um if a young person's transitioning from a youth to an adult probation can hold the youth rehabilitation order uh, you can have loads of different requirements that can be put onto a youth uh, rehabilitation order requirements such as electronic monitoring curfew, also colloquially known as TAG. Um, it might be an exclusion zone from a certain area uh, or other prohibitive activities such as not to contact the victim, not to contact certain friends or peers that are related to their offending behavior. Uh, detention training order, that's a custodial sentence, minimum four months, maximum 24 months. It's always half in, half out. You, uh, young people can get, um, they'll, they can get early release, they'll be eligible if a, a detention and training order is more than, uh, I believe it's eight months old. Also, uh, yeah, eight months. And, um, You've got longer term custodial sentences, which are only available in the Crown Court and detention at Her Majesty's pleasure. So mandatory sentence for murder um, on offence where it is fixed at life imprisonment. Uh, next page, please. Does youth justice work? I guess that's one of the most important questions. Uh, there's been a significant decrease in the number of children in the youth justice system. You can see there by the stats. Uh, those stats were taken in 2017. Um, I'd say probably, uh, I, in my opinion, there are elements of it that you know that it, it works. I, I'd certainly say that. Um, next page, please. Uh, the Ministry of Justice would consider the youth, um, youth justice system a success. And uh, you can see some of the statistics that they would quote uh, to show that it, it is a success. Uh, next page, please. However, there are criticisms, of course. So... Um, Cases involving children take 40% longer than they did in 2010. Um, I mean, to, even I find it hard to believe, on average, 491 days on average to deal with a child from offence to conviction. Now, those kind of times is what we're actually seeing in this COVID era now, because the courts were closed for a period of time. There was a massive backlog of cases. So... It's now commonplace. I'll go to court, and there are young people. There are young people, or young people that uh, are being allocated to me, and offences they committed uh, 14, 
15, 16 months ago um, are now coming to fruition now through the youth uh, justice system. And by that time, that's a long period of time in a teenager's life. You can imagine how frustrating it, could, it can be to try and recollect um, things that they had done almost a year and a half ago. Reoffending rates for children are higher than they were 10 years ago. Um, and it says with 40.9% of young people committing an offence within a year being convicted or cautioned in 2017 in comparison to, to, to adults. So what that's essentially saying is that um, it's even our first time entrants have gone down. Uh, some of the uh, you know, the young people who are more prolific, they are the ones that are probably driving up those numbers, those, those reoffending rates. Um, their criminality seems a bit more durable, for want of a better term. Um, looked after children are still being prosecuted for damaging their hair, their care homes, assaulting staff. Um, it's, it's always sad to see that in court. It really is a young person with um, uh, a difficult upbringing going to court because they, they smashed up their care home. Uh, disproportionality, um, that, has, that has got worse, it's, it's, it's increased. So, and the proportion of children who've received the youth caution or sentence who were black, Asian, um, you know, B-A-M-E for short, has doubled since 2010. Um, it's, it, it really um, almost doubled. Uh, it's something that the system is trying to get, well, on paper, they're trying to get a grip of it, but uh, I haven't seen it. I think other colleagues will not, will not, will not really seeing it. Um, you can see when you're sometimes, uh, you'll go, to, I've been to court and uh, someone, a uh, person of, of, of color will, they'll get a sentence, uh, a, a more harsh sentence than someone uh, who appears uh, white, British, English, or a traveler will get a much worse part, will get a much worse punishment. And it'll be for the same offense. Um, children being brought to court in handcuffs, locked behind bulletproof glass. I never knew that the glass in the dock was bulletproof um, in magistrates courts. Uh, the glass has gaps so that the young person can speak for it. So um, uh, bulletproof, it wouldn't make any difference because you could shoot through those gaps anyway. But um, generally, uh, we're not meant to put, uh, young people aren't really meant to go on the dock. Officially, if there's a risk of custody, they should go in the dock. And most pre-sentence reports would be considered what we call all options. So custody and community sentences, they should go into the dock. Uh, a lot of, in my experience, a lot of magistrates will say, look, uh, just to relieve any anxiety, don't go in the dock uh, because I'm not going to send, I'm not going to send, I'm not going to send you to prison. So there's no, there's no point. Um, but uh, use the use of the dock, shouldn't, it shouldn't be used to, to scare young people. Um, Youth courts, loads of them have closed all around the country. And what you're having is that um, rival um, gang members, uh, just rival people who aren't in a gang, you know, people that have issues of others, they're all in the same in court. Low, you can have loads and loads and loads of problems in courts now uh, for this reason. And um, also, um, you get thousands of children that are left in limbo for months or years when released under investigation. Um, they're absolutely low to see all the time now. Uh, next page, please. Uh, that's a bit about some of the relevant legislation that we use. Um, I'm not going to go into any details about them, um, but just thought you might like to you might like to see it. And um, next page, which is the last page. Thank you for listening. And 
that image I hope is how we want all the young people that come through the system to end up being like as happy and uh, you know um, as happy and cheerful as as, as that as that image and uh, reading their books and their tablets and um, nice and unified and uh, pretty looking. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you so Thank much. That was um, that was really interesting. I have so many thoughts, so many questions. Um, what you do is really intense. Like there is, like there is, it's so complex, and you're dealing with young people that have had really difficult starts. In life.